receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I bear good fruit and others will see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have already been stirring our hearts this morning through worship, through dance. And now as we go into your word, Father, we ask that you give us eyes to see. I ask that the Holy Spirit would bring things to my remembrance, to think through my mind and speak through my lips, so that I may preach your word precisely and accurately. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to conclude um, the message, Experiencing God versus Knowledge of God. And so far, what we've covered is that if we come to receive information, receive knowledge of the Word of God, and we leave without application, all we have is information. If we come to get information, to get the knowledge of God, we leave and apply the information, then we have transformation, or we could say we have change. Now, when we come here and leave with just information, all we have spent time doing is growing old in the Lord, coming week after week, year after year. It may not be year after year in this church. It could have been you have been in church your whole life and haven't grown up in the Lord. When we actually apply the word, have transformation or change, we actually grow up in the Lord. Last week, we discussed four steps to begin experiencing God. And they were number one, you have to receive Christ. First thing you have to do is receive Christ. Remember, I gave the flashlight example. This is you, the batteries inside is Christ, but I still don't have the light unless I use the power button to access the battery, to access Christ in me. So the first way of experiencing God is to receive Christ. The second thing is to obtain knowledge of God's word and his promises and instructions. And the only way you obtain knowledge is through the Bible, through the word of God. You can do that at home. You do that when we come here to church. But remember, you can have knowledge without experience, but you cannot have experience without knowledge. So you have to learn about the person you believe in. You have to learn what the instructions and the promises are. The third thing is you have to apply the knowledge. We have to continuously practice what we're learning. So if you want to be faithful, you have to practice faith. If you want to be loving, you have to practice love. And the fourth step was to find someone to hold you accountable. It's not easy reading the Bible, let alone living by it. So you can't do it by yourself. So we talked about the importance of you need somebody else to hold you accountable to the Word of God. So today what I want to talk to you about is the practical application of God's Word for us to experience Him personally in our life. And when I mean practical application, I want to help you understand in the most simplest form of applying God's Word in a balanced fashion. You following me? Yes. Well, if you're not, you will in a moment. So let's turn to Galatians 5. I'm going to read Galatians 5 um, to you from the New Living Translation to kind of get us started here. Galatians 5, we're going to start at verse 16. It says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Remember, Minister Terrence talked about the war within. What we want to do is contrary to what the Spirit wants us to do. And that is a a real thing. That's just what Victoria and Faith just demonstrated to us through their, their dance for offering. There is that battle that goes on between our flesh and our spirit. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when we are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. So when you're following your own fleshly desires, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, socracy, hostility, quarreling, 
jealousness, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. That's a lot. When you follow your sinful nature, when you follow your own fleshly desire, these are the things that happen. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, anyone that living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these. Verse 24, for those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desire of their sinful nature to his cross and crucify them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. In every part of our life. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. There's so much conflict and friction going on in our world right now that if we just did that, we would be so much better. And the world doesn't have to do that. If we as believers just did not become conceited or provoking one another or be jealous of one another, we wouldn't have so much friction, at least, among us. But we have that struggle. So verse 21, this is where I want to put our emphasis. It says, let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Living this sort of life, what sort of life? The life of following your sinful nature. So anyone who lives the life that follows their sinful nature, lust, jealousy, quarreling, wild parties, drunkenness, enviness, confusion, division, anyone who lives that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Does that mean that I won't go to heaven? Well, first of all, we know that your works don't save you, right? Right? Your works don't save you. The scripture doesn't say accept Christ and live perfectly and you'll go to heaven. It just says to accept Christ. So why does it say that anyone that lives this sort of life, meaning the life after your flesh, will not inherit the kingdom of God? What does that mean? Well, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. Okay? So the kingdom of God is not heaven. It is not salvation. It's not salvation, it isn't heaven, it isn't the church. The kingdom of God is the rule of God, but not the place in which God rules. So heaven is under the rule of God. It is placed under the rule of God. Heaven is not the kingdom, but heaven is under God's rule. Salvation is not the kingdom, but it is through salvation that we become under the kingdom of God, or we become under God's rule. Pastor Grady talked about that this morning, how we have to die to self. When we're saved, we surrender ourselves to God's rule. When we get saved, that's what, it, when we say we die to self, now Pastor Grady hit it on the button this morning. In theory, when you're saved, you give up your rule for God's rule. That's what it means that I lay down my life for Christ. But the reality is, you gave your heart to Christ. You haven't surrendered your life. Because we're still under our own rule. So, the scripture says, those who live this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, if you're living under your rule, you're not living under God's rule, you will not have love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Because you keep living under your rule. Are you following me? If we think that Christianity is just taking a theological position and coming here for a glorified Bible study, all you have done was come to get information. It is time that we start living under God's rule because under his rule, we have all those things. So I'm going to break out with the flashlight again. So this flashlight's us. The battery is Christ, right? Okay, so the battery is Christ. Now, if I put this on, but not all the way, can I get this light? Why? Because this is not connected. So, this is God's rule. You have Christ, 
but you must be connected to my rule. Otherwise, you won't have the light. So when we choose to not put this on, because I don't have no strength, I do, because I'm at 20 push-ups right now. Okay, so when we put this on, we choose to be connected. And now, I have the light, because I'm connected. When you're not connected, see, I'm so strong, can't get it done. When you're not connected, you have no joy, you have no peace, you have no gentleness, you have no patience, you have no self-control, you have no love, because you connected to yourself. You're connected to your rule instead of God's rule. If I told you once, I'm telling you again, he who lives this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. doesn't mean that you're not going to go to heaven. It means what you have as an inheritance, as a child of God, to live in abundance, to walk in love, to have peace despite what the world gives us, you don't have it because you're not connected or under God's rule. Amen? Andre and I start watching this show. Now, if you go watch it, that's on you. <laughs> All right, so I think it's on regular TV. I'm not sure we saw it on Hulu, but we started watching this new show. It's called Life or Debt. So D-E-B-T. Follow me? Okay, so, you know, I'm a financial person. I love anything about finances. No matter how much I know, I can always learn something new. I, I love to read, watch, or get my hands on anything related to finances. And um, it actually do you some good. Just putting that out there. We should know how to be good stewards of God's money. Anyway, so I'm watching this show, and, you know, I'm very sensitive to the things that I watch. I won't watch scary movies. I can't listen to a bunch of war movies where they're dropping the F-bomb. That, like, just irks my spirit. Well, you know, when people talk about their money, they get a little ugly, okay? And they do drop some words, but they beep them out. So that's why I said, if you decide to watch it, that's between you and God. But anyway, so we're watching this show, and I'm learning something out of every show. So I have to explain this show to you for you to understand where I'm going. So it's called Life or Debt, and they take a family who submitted all their financials to this financial advisor who comes in, and what he does is he takes over, kind of like a business takes takeover, he takes over their finances. So he says this is a takeover. So he determines how they spend their money, their behavior patterns, and he tells them what to do. He gives them tools to use, and in 90 days he comes back because he expects you to run your house like a business. So he teaches them, he assigns them who's going to be the CEO, who's going to be the CFO, and then he comes back in 90 days to see what you've done. So there's, I think it's the first series, there's like 11 of them. I watched all 11 of them. And they get to a pastor. Now that sparked my interest. I'm like, wow, he just put himself out there like that as a pastor? And so what the pastor explained is that his ministry was his first priority, not his family. And that was his excuse for why their finances were in disarray. Because as little as he was getting paid not taking care of the family's needs, he felt that was more important than whether his family suffered financially. Now, I'm not, put, th this is on TV, so, you know, he already put himself out there. So, anyways, he has this revelation throughout this process. He starts crying and says, I can't be infective in ministry if my family's broken. And Andre and I are sitting there baffled, like, okay, for real. <laughs> Okay, this man's about to get it together. We're rooting for you. You a pastor. You on TV. Come on now. Be an example. We already watched 11 other people do it right. So at the end of the day, he didn't listen to anything the guy said. He didn't listen to anything he said. And when the financial advisor came back in 90 days, he was in a worse situation than when the guy came. Why? Because he didn't apply it. He didn't even apply the tools that were given to him. And he's a pastor. So that, that did a number of things for us was the balance. We have to keep a balance in the word. And the reason this is relative because this is my Bible, this is God speaking to me. Now you could take a scripture out of here and run with it. But if you don't have the proper balance, even what you think you're doing unto the Lord will cause destruction. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this to you. Proverbs 11.1 1 says that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So while we're pursuing to experience God, you have to keep a balance of the word. Otherwise, you're going to be viewed as one of those crazy Christians. Seriously. I know people who are at church 24-7 and their house is a hot mess. What kind of example are you giving? So let me show you this. Okay, the priorities of God are God, spouse, family, ministry, work. If we can get the media team to put that up there for me. Okay, these are the priorities of God. To experience God, I have to know who God is. So I have to spend time in his word to know who he is, spend time in prayer, get the instructions for my life. When I get married, my spouse becomes my second love because my first love is God. And when I'm spending time in his word, then I learn how to love my spouse. Now, if I'm not married, for you young folks, if I'm not married, God's my first love. And when I find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, then I know to keep them in their proper perspective, respective order. Because if I seek them as my God and work hard to please them, they'll never be satisfied and my marriage will be a mess. So it's important for you to know this order whether you have a spouse or not. Because trust me, as soon as you get a spouse, you're not going to all of a sudden know what to do. you got to practice what to do right now. Okay, so I'm married. Now I have children. But the children are not my main focus. Because if your family is all about the kids... Now your spouse feels neglected and you're not going to have a happy marriage. On the other hand, the Bible says to train up your children in the way that they should go. The way they should go. Well, the only way you know how to train the children in the way they should go is getting to the word. But we have to keep a balance. Yes, I must train them, but they don't become my life. Okay? Now ministry. Yes, you are supposed to serve. But that doesn't mean you serve everywhere. You know what it's going to do to your family? They're going to resent God, resent coming to church. Then when things don't work right, they're going to wonder where's God. Right? We all wonder where, I'm wondering where he at right now. We all got stuff going on, right? We're the first person to say, when a leader tells us they want to serve somewhere, the first thing we say is, how does your spouse feel? Well, of course, pray about it. How does your spouse feel about it? And if we think we think you're doing too much, we will tell you no. Because we care more about God's spouse family than we do where you serve it. Leaders, can I get a witness? Because how many times have you come to us and we said no, I thank you, but no. How does your wife feel about it? How does your husband feel about it? Did you speak to your spouse about it? Because what you do in ministry hinders your spouse and your family. And we need to keep God's priorities. There has to be a balance. We're supposed to work. Do you know, what is it, Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, anyone, ooh, now, that's the Bible. Don't get mad at me. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. You ain't working taking care of your family? The Bible says you're worse than a sinner. So is work important? Yes. yes. But should you be working to death where you neglect your family and don't have time for God? Do you see, you see where I'm going with this? The Bible tells us clearly what we need to be doing. But if we do too much in one area and neglect the others, thinking you've done something, you've only hindered it. My heart was so, we were so... We watched the show with the pastor two or three times to see if we missed something. Because I just couldn't understand for the life of me why he would not apply what he was given. How did he sound as a man of God that my ministry comes before my family? I don't get that. But think about how many times we do things not in God's order for the sake of God, supposedly. Now, if I can get that next slide up. God expects us, 
God Spouse Family Ministry work. To do all this and keep a balance in the midst of life circumstances. You're doing this. I get up, I get up, I'm gonna speak about me. Get up, pray, get into my war room, read the word. Honor my husband before he leaves. Pray for my husband while he's gone. Support him. Make sure he has what he needs by the time he gets home from work. I take care of family first that needs to be done. I don't set appointments up unless I know everything is done at home. And if I'm going somewhere and I'm making something, I make two, leaving one for them, and I take one with me. Otherwise, what do they say? Oh, you always make something for them, but you don't make nothing for us. What are we, what are we teaching our kids? All they're going to do is resent what we do if we don't take care of family. So by the time I have to leave to do ministry or work, nobody's complaining because I've done my priorities first. But in the midst of that, health challenges, depression sets in, unexpected expenses, problems on the job, offense, conflict, addiction, temptation. So what do we do? How do we experience God in the midst of all of that? What do we do? We pray, but we apply what we've been learning when we first were learning about God. So when you're reading your Bible, what are you reading? When you're having Bible time at home, or if you have Bible time, what are you reading? So when all these things happen, what's coming out? Worry, because you haven't been reading, and all you've been doing is meditating on what you don't have? What do you do? Now, the danger we face if all we have is knowledge and don't apply it is what the Bible warns us against about not being like the Pharisees. Oh, they knew the law, but they weren't necessarily living it or really knowing God or loving God. But they were quick to put the law on somebody in judgment. You know, we're quick to respond to what we don't agree with somebody living on social media with the word, but even our response to them about the word is wrong. So we have to start applying. You know, it it infuriates me. I don't understand. Maybe y'all could help me understand. I don't understand why people have to be so disrespectful about our president. We're believers, and it I can't I don't understand why believers talk so bad. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to respect those who are in authority and pray for them. So if you didn't like something I did, would you talk about how horrible of a person I am on social media? So why would we talk about this person was placed who is the president over our country? So why are we bash we're believers? Why are we bashing them publicly? Because we don't like what they do. I don't like either candidate we have but that's who we got. So I got to pray. And when whoever becomes president, I'm not going to be bashing them. They going to need more prayer. So why are we we doing this? We do this in every area of our life. Why are we doing this? We need to pray. You know, I started praying when, when President Barack Obama, the only thing I didn't really care for, which I'm sure we all got a lot, but what I didn't care for when he changed his stands on marriage. But you know what? My prayer changed for him at that time was, Lord, help him to know you so intimately and personally that it changes his decision making. Because once you come to know God and experience God, it affects what we say and it affects what we do. So instead of us talking about this person, he ain't doing nothing for our country. I can't wait for him to get out of office. Da, 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 da. We should be like, Lord, change it. My prayer for these last few months have been let him finish his race strong. Give him the, the wisdom to finish his race strong. Help him to see you because his influence won't be over when he's not president anymore. I just, we watched a special that asked him to do something, try to bridge this gap between us as a nation for, um, for racism Uh, to use his influence to help do that. And so, you know, we still need to pray. Just because they're out of office don't mean they're out. We still need to pray. Anyways, I didn't mean to go on a tangent about that. But so what happens when um, we just know the word and all these things happen and we don't do anything, Matthew 7, 21, it's in the Amplified. Now I want you to, if you don't have the Amplified, read the screen. Did I give you the wrong, um, Matthew 7, the one before that? 
Do you have Matthew 7, 21? Matthew 7, 21, verse 23 in the Amplified. Okay, this is, was Jesus saying, don't be like the Pharisees. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not kingdom of God. Now we're talking about heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven... Many will say to me on that day when I judge them, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, driven out demons in your name, done many miracles in your name? And then I will declare to them publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me. You are banished from my presence. You who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. See, we can quote scripture and have knowledge of God. But for God to know us as his own, we have to experience him. Because you can say, well, you know, I came to church. I served on the usher team. I was on the worship team. But you lived the way you wanted to live. I never knew you. How many times have we come back to do you really believe? God knows your heart. We don't know your heart. God does. Now, when we walk in what we've learned and actually apply it to our life, this not only affects us, there's a reward for that, but when others see us walk out the Bible, in the Bible it's called beatitudes, but the definition of the word beatitude is supreme blessedness. How many want some supreme blessedness? I don't just want to be blessed. I want some supreme blessedness. You know what I'm saying? I don't want just a brownie. I want a brownie supreme. You know what I'm saying? With some ice cream, some hot fudge, some nuts, and a cherry on top. So when you experience God and others are watching you, this is what you get. So... I'm going to read it briefly from the New Living Translation, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. These are the Beatitudes or Supreme Blessedness. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom is theirs. Okay, so when it says God blesses, what I want you to think in your mind is Supreme Blessedness. Okay? God blesses or give supreme blessedness who are poor. How many of you don't have as much money as you would like? I said as much money as you would like. Okay? But realize their need for him. So I may not have what I like, but I know my need for him, and I get supreme blessedness. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, work for peace. We have to work for peace. Even when peace is not around us, we have to work for peace. For they will be called the children of God. See, people who don't walk in peace, you don't even think they are Christian because they acted so ungodly. That just irks me, by the way, if you can't tell. God blesses you when people, did I skip one? Yes, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you. Have you been lying? Oh, I can't stand when people lie on me. You don't like that, do you? God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Amen? Yeah. Be happy about it. Yeah. Don't be sad they're talking about you. That means you're doing something right. Yeah. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward 
awaits you in heaven. Don't let nobody steal your reward. See, what I think is funny, first of all, I, when I was first saved, did not think it was going to be cool praising God all day in heaven. That sounded boring to me. I know I'm not the only one. Do that sound fun? Seriously? Let's be for real. That don't sound fun. All, think about that. All day, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and all we're going to do is praise God. I was like, I don't know if that really sounds like where I want to go, but it's better than hell. <laughs> but now that I'm where I'm at, I could worship God all day. Because I've grown up in the Lord and I've learned to enter worship and what happens to me. And if this is how I feel now and I can't see him, how am I going to feel when I do see him? I'm just saying. That's when the Bible becomes real. See, I was at a funeral and saw someone die at the funeral. That was real to me. Because it was like that moment, that person just left here and went one or the other. A great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So if you remember, we've studied this out before, right? We studied it out before. So what I'm just going to show you, because the Amplified, when it says blessed, the Amplified gives a different supreme blessedness meaning to each one of these. So what I did is kind of shorten it for us to see. So we're going to look at, if you are poor, meek, merciful or peacemakers we can put that slide up your supreme blessedness means this is this is people looking at you happy to be envied spiritually prosperous with life joy and satisfaction in god's favor and salvation regardless of your outward condition okay life joy that means even when i'm poor and, and things aren't peaceful and chaotic, and I feel like, Lord, have mercy on me. Regardless of my outward condition, I find a life joy. People are envied of my supreme blessedness. You know why? Because the poor discovers their need for God in being poor. If you weren't in that situation, you wouldn't discover your need for him. See, when we had six figures, I didn't need to pray for finances. I already had it. But when it was all gone, I found out real quickly that I needed him. Because a penny in my account wasn't going to work. And I don't wear poor well. That don't work for me. That's right, baby. One day, Andre will have to, to tell you, he needs to tell you his, tes his, his testimony. Sometimes, a few times, Andre lived in his car. So when we went through that time, he was like, baby, this ain't nothing but a thing. I got this. I was like, well, I don't know about you because that ain't me. You better find a covering over me because we ain't doing that. But we have grown so much because we saw God. We realized our need for him. So we carried a life joy that the people around us didn't understand because they were looking at our outward conditions. But when they saw our life joy, that was to be envied. See, we're all experiencing life, but the way you apply it is going to determine your supreme blessedness. So you're either going to grow old in the Lord and never grow up and experience supreme blessedness, or you're going to experience it, and you're going to attract the others around you to find out what you have. If you are, you know, people want a testimony, but they don't want the test. Amen. Amen. You can't have a testimony without the test. Amen. And if you don't have an experience, you won't have a revelation. See, when that pastor said, I can't be effective in ministry if my family is broken, I thought that was his revelation. He got it. But that was like for two seconds. And then he went back doing what he was doing. You can't have a revelation without an experience. So for you to get taken to a low, you realize you need something greater than you. So we have those who mourn or pure in heart. Their supreme blessedness is a happiness that is produced 
by the, uh, it's the next slide, please. Um, happiness that is produced by the experience, by the experience, by the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation of his matchless grace. Okay, think about that. Think about someone who is mourning. And I think I gave this example before. When um, Pastor Lori went to the store, they didn't have any money. Well, they had some money, not a lot of money, not enough to feed their big family. This after Pastor had died. And Dylan, you remember this? She found a Smith's gift card, and Dylan went with her to the store. And he went up, Lori asked him to, to go find out how much was on that card, and Dylan came back looking like he saw a ghost. And she was like, what? He was like, there's $500 on this card. <laughs> okay. That was experiencing his matchless grace. So think about that. You don't see his matchless grace until you experience him in something. She, in her mourning of, Lord, my husband isn't here. The life insurance money is almost gone. I physically cannot work. How do I feed my babies? Whatever is on this gift card, I'm going to make work. Because she was a doer like that. If it was $50, she was going to figure out how to do it. But when he came back and said it was $500, she said, Timberly, I never put $500 on a gift card. Now, these are the kind of people our pastors were. They had gift cards on hand to bless people. But she said she had never put $500 on a card. But that, see, when you experience his matchless grace, then you walk around with a happiness because it's produced by you experiencing it. See, if you have never experienced it, then you constantly doubt there's a God. You have to, ex you have to experience him. You have to. Okay, the next one is the hunger and thirst for justice, which is in most translations say knowledge. So the person that hungers for this, not the person who dreads coming to church or opening up their Bible, the person who hungers and is thirst. See, just like I can, I'll watch and read anything about money and find something, I love learning new things about the Word. Amen. As much as I think I know is as much as I don't know. Amen. We can always learn something. We're never going to run out of things to learn or talk about with the Word of God. So he's saying those that hunger and thirst for knowledge, those who want this knowledge, in that, stain, that, uh, that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation. That's kind of like the brand-new Christian that's so excited. Like the honeymoon stage, they're so excited to, to be saved, and they're all into the word, and then life hits them, and that excitement just, oh, well, you know. Kind of like you're dating and it's nice and then you get married and you're like, oh, that's just my husband. No, you have to continue that excitement. Thank you. That's right. I know you love being married to me, babe. That's right. See, we don't, those that thirst for this knowledge does not dread coming to church. Doesn't dread getting into the word. Now, I don't mean to be mean when I say this. I love you. But if you're not thirsty for God's word, you currently don't understand the magnitude of your salvation. We don't just want fire insurance, do we? I mean, salvation will keep you from hell, but it ain't going to escape hell from this world. You know, and the thing is, we've had so many people die in this country for our freedom for religion, our freedom to worship, to choose what religion. We're not forced what religion. I'm so grateful that we don't live in a country that forces us to uh, practice one religion. But yet, with that freedom we have, people don't want to worship in church. We come to church. Praise God, hallelujah. People died for us to have this freedom and not be killed for this freedom. We don't have to go hide underground to praise and worship. 
but we're living in a time where nobody's thirsty for knowledge. Yeah. But we, and, and, and still, as jacked up as you may think this country is, we are still the country people are willing to l l lose their lives to come to. So we have the freedom to worship God freely and come experience him. Amen. We have that freedom. Amen. And too many of us take that for granted. Amen. Persecuted for righteousness sake. The supreme blessedness is in the state of which the born again child of God enjoys and finds satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of his outward condition. This is the person who is saved that grows up in the Lord, applies the word, and then faces persecution for it, but regardless of that, continues to praise and worship him. So we have some, some family, friends that don't necessarily believe what we believe. And when we went through our, our challenging times, they were laughing at us, wanting to know where was this God y'all been serving. We had to find the joy regardless of what it looked like to them because we knew what was happening on the inside and because we weren't moved by their opinions they became believers by us not being moved regardless of your outward condition I remember our brother-in-law had moved us and he was like, y'all don't look like a family struggling. That's the testimony. That is the testimony. We don't walk around, oh, I'm pathetic. I'm a hot mess. You carry yourself like, they don't know you a hot mess. They don't know you ain't got nothing. Because that is the life joy that you have from experiencing God. That is the life joy that you have. And, you know, just because we're Christians don't mean we can't have fun. Amen. And, you know, being, thinking that it's a, you know, we can't do certain things because we're a Christian. You know, I don't need to get drunk to have a good time. I will almost pee on myself laughing so hard at myself. <laughs> and when I wake up in the morning, I'm just as happy as I was when I went to bed that night. I'm not hurled over a toilet throwing up because seemingly I was having fun. Seriously. Yes. Victoria says, yes. You hear me? Yes. I'm not going to let you talk about me because I don't do what you do because I'm a Christian. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to wake up happy regardless of my condition. And tomorrow morning, you're going to be wondering what you did last night. The application of God's word is simple. But the reason it's so complex is because we, at the end of the day, decide to live under our own rule. Until we live under God's rule, we will not be able to experience him. We have to truly die to self every day. We have to submit our own rule down. In theory, we did that when we were saved. But we have to make a conscious effort to do that daily. Now, what tangible advice can I give you in applying God's word? Want to know? Here you go. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. Change your thinking. If there's an area in your life where you're not experiencing God, find two to three scriptures to stand on. Okay? I say two to three scriptures because the word discerns the word. If you take one scripture and take it out of context, you will build a whole doctrine around it. And if you don't understand the context, then ask your accountability partner to help you understand it if you don't. You see why having an accountability partner is so important? But anyways, if you're going through something that you're not experiencing God in, find two or three scriptures that you can stand on and start meditating on it. Meditating on it. Meditating on it day and night. And let your mind re be renewed. And trust me, when it comes down to making a decision, what's going to come out is what has been planted on your mind. 
Praise God, Minister Terrence read that scripture that I was going to reference this morning. Because out of the abundance of the heart, we say and do things. So if you're not experiencing God, that's because the things you've been saying and the things you are doing are the things that are in your mind, which are contrary to God's word. So trust me, if you meditate on a scripture, however many times a day you need to, and something comes up, that's the first thing that's going to come out of your heart. What's in your heart starts first in your mind. And when the pressures of life happen, we find out what's really in your heart. When the pressures of life happen, we find out what's really in your heart. If we put God's word on our minds and meditate on it, it will change our heart. And we will want to please God. And then we would see God and experience God. If you don't believe me, try it. Just try it. And like we read with the Beatitudes, regardless of your outward condition, when you seek God and find life joy, regardless of your outward condition, you will see God. And when that revelation happens, you will experience him in ways you have never seen. Let's pray.